everyone. In today's lecture, we will talk about Edmund degradation method of protein sequencing. Uh, it's a chemical sequencing method and uh, we know that in order to identify a protein, the only thing you can do is you do it sequencing. You do sequencing and then your identification can be made if you have a known protein in hand. So first thing, in order to know what protein that is, you need to find out its amino acid sequence. And uh, in today's lecture, we'll talk about uh, this chemical sequencing method to know identity of a protein, which was given by Edmund. And that's why it's called Edmund degradation method of protein and peptide sequencing. Before that, we know the sequence of a protein is called as primary structure of the protein. And uh, this primary structure is basically linear, ordered and one dimensional. And by convention, it is written from N-terminal to C-terminal. Means the first amino acid, for example, here in case of insulin, it has two chains. First amino acid in chain one is say glycine. So this is N-terminal amino acid, and this is called N-terminal end of the protein. In the same way, the last amino acid is called C-terminal amino acid. It will have a carboxyl terminal as free. So that's why it's called a C-terminal. There's a convention to write sequence of a protein or primary structure of a protein. And this primary structure of the protein is not thermodynamically stable. When translation has occurred in cytosol, DNA is uh, converted into, DNA sequence is converted into messenger RNA from messenger RNAs encoded to protein sequence. So when ribosome is synthesizing this protein primary structure, it is not thermodynamically stable because it has hydrophobic patches and those hydrophobic regions, they don't like to interact with water in cytosol. This we have discussed earlier in a lecture uh, on protein folding what's called hydrophobic effect. So due to hydrophobic effect, this primary structure of a protein which is thermodynamically unstable in water, aqueous environment in cytosol, it adopt a globular shape. That's what you call protein folding. Now, why to determine sequence of a protein? The very important thing is to identify the protein. For identification, sequencing of the protein is required. And uh, if you have sequence available, you can calculate theoretical molecular weight of the protein. You can calculate uh, theoretical isoelectric point of the protein. You can know the charge on the protein, the acidic protein or basic protein. You also can calculate extinction coefficient of the protein from sequence available. Then uh, hydrophobicity and membrane spanning regions also understood uh, from the sequence or primary structure of a protein. And uh, you also understand uh, the potential post-translational modification sites if they are present in the protein from the available sequence. Sequences and composition uh, of proteins often reflect function of the protein, not always. So uh, if you have sequence and composition available, you can, uh, you can think of its function also. That's only in fact possible in case of proteins which have a similar protein available in the database. Uh, for example, if you have a protein from one organism, that's already available function is known. And you find out same protein from some other organism, homologous protein. And when you match the sequence, you find a good identity between sequences. So you can think that it, this protein also has the same function because matching maximum with the protein available from different organisms. So often proteins of similar function will have similar sequences. We know that uh, sequence of a protein determine uh, shape of the protein and therefore function of the protein. So if you, if you change anything in the primary sequence, primary structure of the protein, function also get altered. That's why we have seen in earlier lecture on Enfinson experiment, that one of the conclusions of Enfinson experiment was primary structure is responsible for the function, right? So if you have homologous proteins from different organism, so those proteins will have similar sequences, homologous sequences. So in that case, you can find out function of the protein from sequence. But in case of new protein, novel proteins, you cannot uh, find out function of the protein just from the sequence. 
This is only possible when you have homologous proteins available. The information of similar protein available in the database. In that case, the func finding function is easier from the sequence comparison of the protein. And uh, there are two ways of sequencing proteins. One is indirect method and other one is a direct sequencing method. Indirect method means we know from the central dogma that proteins are encoded from DNA. So in order to know sequence of the protein, DNA sequence can be determined. So if you have DNA sequence means the gene encoding for that particular protein. So when you have gene sequence available, uh, that uh, gene sequence uh, it can be used uh, used to identify used to know the sequence of the protein also because we know from the genetic code the triplet of nucleotides in dna they encode for um, different amino acids so using using central dogma and genetic code uh, we can find out sequence of the protein from corresponding gene sequence so that's the indirect method of sequencing proteins then uh, a second is direct amino acid sequencing. When you have protein available, that protein can be used for to know the sequence of the protein. That's a very important one is the chemical method, chemical sequencing method. That's what we'll discuss in today's lecture, Edmund degradation method. Then uh, mass spectroscopy, tender mass spectroscopy is also in today's time used extensively in order to uh, identify proteins to know sequence of the proteins. So that is beyond, uh, beyond the scope of this lecture. So uh, we also need to understand uh, identification of N terminal. Means uh, you have a protein and uh, we know that it's a specific sequence of amino acids. So we also can find out what is the first amino acid on N terminal on the protein using chemicals. There are different chemicals available which react with the N-terminal and they form derivative of the N-terminal amino acid and that derivative of that chemical with the N-terminal amino acid can be easily identified based on their uh, different properties. For example, densyl chloride is one of the reagent which is used to identify N-terminal. Then you have um, othaldehyde OPA or PITC phenyl isothiocyanate, then uh, you have FMOC, N fluorinyl methyl chloroformate, which also react with the N terminal of uh, N terminal amino acid of proteins. Then you have uh, 6 amino quinolyl N hydroxysuccinamidyl carbamate AQC, and FDNB fluorodinitrobenzene, and dapsyl chloride. So these are the chemicals which are used, which are used to identify N-terminal first amino acid of the protein. These chemicals react with the N-terminal amino acid and form some product which can be identified. For example, in case of uh, fluorodinitrobenzene, 1-fluoro-2-4-dinitrobenzene FDNB or DFNB, this is also known as Sanger's reagent. Sanger's use uh, this chemical in order to sequence uh, insulin 1953 and he was given Nobel Prize for this this work. In fact, Sanger got uh, Nobel Prize for sequencing of DNA also. So this uh, FDNB reagent, it reacts with the N-terminal. You have this uh, amino acid sequence, protein sequence. FDNB reacts with the alpha amino group of the terminal N-terminal amino acid and form a derivative. That's basically 2,4-dinitro uh, benzene derivative of terminal amino acid. So then uh, hydrolysis can be made using 6 molar HCl and boil it over 100 degree, say 110 degree temperature. So in that case, this uh, terminal amino acid from here, this can be removed. This can be removed like this one. But when you boil this, uh, this peptide here with 6 molar HCl, at high temperature, all other peptide bonds, they are also hydrolyzed. So you get mixture of free amino acids and along with that, the N-terminal amino acid is derivatized by this reagent. Now this can be identified to know what is the first amino acid, N-terminal amino acid in the protein because this derivative will have unique chromatographic properties and using those properties, it can be identified. 
in the similar way densile chloride and uh, debsile chloride they also uh, do react with the n-terminal amino acid and in order to remove the n-terminal derivative of these compounds also you one need to hydrolyze like acid hydrolysis one need to perform for this uh, reaction and in that case you will again get the mixture of free amino acids and first amino acid as derivative of these chemical so the problem here is that you only know first amino acid but in order to know complete sequence you cannot use it's very difficult to use even Sanger's reagent or these other reagents to know the entire sequence of the peptide because the rest of the peptide is also become hydrolyzed so you get only free amino acids and these free amino acids they are useless you cannot use them to know sequence so that was the major problem with these chemicals and Sanger's also faced that issue that's why in fact he took more than 10 years just to sequence insulin which is just 51 amino acid long and today's time uh, insulin like protein can be sequenced in two to three days so rapid but Sanger's took very long time because that time uh, the advanced chemicals were not available like Edmunds reagent so that's the difference between Edmunds reagent that's also known as PITC phenyl isothiocyanate uh, which was used by Edmund to sequence proteins so that's why it is also called Edmund reagent. Edmund reagent like Sanger's reagent it also react with N-terminal amino acid this is peptide so alpha amino group of first amino acid react with PITC form a derivative and uh, here the difference is that you don't require acid hydrolysis a strong acid hydrolysis in order to remove this amino acid derivative of PITC in mild condition this this hydrolysis can occur and due to mild condition rest of the peptide bond they are also not hydrolyzed so this uh, terminal amino acid is uh, form a cyclic structure with PITC that's called phenyl thiohydantoin derivative of first amino acid this can be identified and from this we can know what is the terminal amino acid uh, in alpha and terminal amino acid in this peptide sequence the advantage here is that rest of the polypeptide is unhydrolyzed so sequence of rest of the peptide remains same it doesn't change because peptide bonds are intact so what can be done this 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 remaining can be sent for again to the cycle for identification of second amino acid and that's how in today's time after this uh, invention after finding of this PITC by Edmund it's become really easy to do chemical sequencing of the peptide in a very short period of time so like uh, you have a protein here so this protein can be allowed to react with the PITC the Edmunds reagent at high pH at high pH Edmund reagent form adduct with the N terminal of the protein with alpha amino group and at low pH only this PITC along with first amino acid is released from the sequence and rest of the sequence remains same the peptide bonds are not hydrolyzed at low pH here and uh, this cyclic structure is basically is converted into a derivative what's called phenyl thiohydantoin derivative PTH now this PTH is having uh, unique chromatographic properties using those it can be identified uh, that uh, it's a derivative PTS derivative of which amino acid out of 20 amino acid available in today's time in protein sequencer a chromatographic column is used and this chrom HPLC column basically uh, it is uh, calibrated with 20 amino acid and their 20 amino acid derivative with the PTH so every pts derivative they have unique retention time in this column and based on the retention time of this column when unknown pts derivatives pass through the same column which is calibrated by these 20 pts derivatives so identification can be made for example say first uh, uh, tyrosine pts tyrosine derivative is giving say uh, 10 second retention time in the column so when you load uh, 
unknown unknown PTS derivative which happen to be eventually tyrosine it will elute at the same time so retention time will be same so by matching retention time of uh, those 20 amino acids uh, their PTS derivative in the same column identification of amino acid can be easily made so this this is identified so we know that what is terminal amino acid know this leftover sequence this is again sent for second cycle of reaction with PITC and it can keep going on until you identify uh, entire sequence in the peptide so in the first cycle you you know the first amino acid in the second cycle you will know the second amino acid and so on so that's how you can do sequencing of a peptide using Edmund degradation method you can do sequencing of peptides uh, which are 20 to 30 amino acid long only uh, with this Edmund degradation method because uh, when you increase if you increase uh, length of the peptide after 20 30 amino acid the background becomes so evident that uh, the peaks are not very distinct the peaks of amino acid you get they are not very distinct so identification of amino acid become really difficult as you increase length of the peptide in this method and that is because of uh, uh, poor efficiency of this uh, sequencers the sequencing method in today's time we have uh, up to 99 percent efficient uh, sequencers and using those sequencers uh, we can only uh, no sequence of up to 50 amino acid only so that uh, let's understand that with an example for example if you have uh, a peptide which is start with say isoleucine then glutamine arginine and some other amino acid and you send it for sequencing using Edmund degradation method and uh, efficiency of this method say it's 90% so in the first cycle, uh, efficiency 90% means in each cycle only 90% reaction would take place. Only 90% reactant would react with PITC. So in the cycle number one, you'll get a peak of isoleucine that is terminal amino acid and uh, the amount of this peak would be 90% of the total concentration. So 90% you will get isoleucine peak which is very clear you will be able to identify it. Now what is left after this reaction? Uh, you will have same 90% of rest of the peptide and rest of the peptide is Q, R and other amino acids. And because efficiency is 90% it means 10% of intact peptide would also be there in the reaction mixture. So you will have 10% of the intact peptide that is I, Q, R and so on. So in the first cycle you will have these two products which will be reacting in cycle number two. So when you go to cycle number two, now each of these reactant, those also will react with the same efficiency with PITC. So what do you get in cycle number two? you'll get 90% of this 90 that means 81% of the peak that is glutamine Q the second amino acid will give you 81% peak of Q so second amino acid is glutamine in this peptide and what will be left uh, there will be same 81% of R and rest of the peptide and because only 90% is reacting so 10% will be left so 10% of 90% that will be 9% of intact QR peptide would be there and same time because this 10% is also there original peptide is also there in the reaction mixture that also will react 90% so 90% of 10 that will be 9% 9% in fact 9% peak you will get another peak another amino acid here that is uh, that is 9% and that is for isoleucine so isoleucine is in the is coming in the cycle number 1 but in cycle 2 also 9% isoleucine peak would be there which is coming from this intact uh, intact peptide 
and 9% QR peptide would be left. Now in the cycle number 3, when you go to cycle number 3, each one of these reactant, those also will react only in, with the same efficiency of 90%. As a result, what you will get, you will get an amino acid that is arginine, it will be around 73% uh, because 90% of 81, that's around 73% of arginine peak would be there. And rest of the reaction mixture will keep becoming more and more heterogeneous. So when you increase number of steps, number of cycles, these background, it also keep increasing. And same time the main peak, which was 90% in cycle number 1, 81% in cycle 2, in cycle 3, 73% that also keep going down. So main peak is going down and background is increasing when you are increasing more number of cycles. So it will happen after certain number of cycles that background will be more evident in comparison to the main peak. So the identification of amino acid will become ambiguous. So that's why due to the lower efficiency of the, uh, this method, you cannot do sequencing of very long peptides. In fact, 20-30 amino acid long peptide, they are very well sequenced using this method. No, but uh, proteins are not limited to 20, 30 or 50 amino acids. We know the protein is very long. So how to do sequencing of the proteins which are very long than 50 amino acid? So in that case, proteins are first fragmented into pieces. For example, you have this long protein and uh, this protein is say 100 or 200 amino acid long. So you cannot send it for sequencing directly. If you do so, you will be able to see only 20 to 30 amino acid from the end terminal side. Complete sequencing cannot be done. So that's why it is called end terminal sequencing. So when you send a intact protein to sequencer, you will know only 20, 30 amino acid from end terminal side of this protein. But uh, if you want to se uh, sequence entire protein, in that case, you need to make fragments of this protein. So the, each fragment is less than 50 amino acid. The smaller the peptide fragment, uh, the most, more efficient the admin degradation method will be in order to sequence it. So proteins are, in order to sequence entire proteins, proteins, uh, polypeptide, they are first fragmented into small peptides. These small peptides, they are separated using chromatographic technique and each peptide is sent for admin degradation. Now, how do you fragment these proteins? Fragmentation is done by enzymes. They are proteases, the family of enzymes which hydrolyze peptide 1, they are proteases and proteases are highly specific. They don't uh, cleave peptide bone randomly. For example, trypsin, very commonly used enzyme in admin degradation method. If we use trypsin, trypsin hydrolyzed C terminal of lysine and arginine amino acid. Depending on number of amino acid, lysine and arginine amino acid, you will get number of fragments from the protein. Then you have chymotrypsin that cleaves C terminal of aromatic amino acid, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Pepsin cleaves N terminal of aromatic amino acid. Then you have staphylococcal protease that uh, react on aspartate and glutamate in the protein sequence. And uh, you also have a cyanogen bromide CNBR, that's a chemical reagent that also cleaves protein from methionine C terminal. So CNBR convert methionine to homoserine lactone and it fragment protein. So for example, if a protein has a two methionine, you are treating with CNBR, so you are going to get three fragments from that protein. Now these fragments are purified using chromatographic technique and after purification each fragment is sequenced using Edmund degradation method. So let's take an example. Uh, for example you have a protein here and you need to do complete sequencing of the protein. So first thing you can do is you can uh, find out composition of the protein. You can do hydrolysis, say acid hydrolysis. You can treat with six molar HCl, boil with 100 degree at 100 degree temperature. And from there, molar ratio of amino acid can be calculated. So amino acid analyzer 
can do that job so from here you will know which amino acid is present in what molar molar ratio or in other word number of amino acid in the protein can be identified each amino acid and how many molecule how many number of that amino acid is there in the protein for example in this case there are total 38 amino acid uh, what uh, we have got after hydrolysis and uh, from here you know each amino number of each amino acid in the protein and uh, this is uh, helpful specifically in case of choosing a protease later on to hydrolyze that into fragments. For example, if you see here, there is uh, one arginine, this one, and there are two lysine. So it means there are three, total three basic amino acid. So if you treat this protein with the trypsin, which cleaves lysine arginine C terminal, you are going to get four fragments. At the same time, if you look at methionine, there are two methionine in the sequence and uh, if you use cyanogen bromide reagent which cleaves at the C terminal of methionine, you will get three fragment with uh, CNBR. So that information is attained from uh, knowing uh, composition, amino acid composition of the protein. In second step, you can know uh, uh, N-terminal amino acid also. For example, you uh, react protein with the uh, fluorodinitrobenzene FDN B Sanger's reagent and uh, you can identify which derivative of uh, dinitrobenzene you are getting which amino acid derivative you are getting so that can be for example here is you are getting 2,4-dinitrophenylglutamate it means glutamate is the N-terminal amino acid so we know that glutamate is present at N-terminal of this protein now uh, you can uh, uh, hydrolyze this protein with trypsin because we know they are three basic amino acids so you are going to get four peptides so when you hydrolyze with trypsin you will get four fragments and these four fragments you can separate them using chromatographic technique you can use HPLC ion exchange chromatography or something and uh, after separation of these four fragments, you can do Edmund degradation sequencing. So from Edmund sequencing, what do you know? You know that these are these four peptides. You call them T1, T2, T3, T4. So these sequences are available. But from here, we do not know whether which is first peptide, second, third and fourth. Order is not there. So now we need to put them into order. You can only know which may be the first peptide. For example, we know that glutamic acid from the second step, glutamic acid is N terminal. So in these peptides, you can see which peptide is having glutamate at N terminal. And that is basically T2 here. So T2 is having E, E stands for glutamic acid. So T2 is having glutamic acid at N terminal. So this must be the first amino, first peptide from N terminal side. But uh, after T2, it will be T1, T3 or T4 that we do not know. So in order to find out this further uh, sequence, you need to use another reagent to hydrolyze the protein into peptide and you need to sequence that also. So here uh, you can choose say cyanogen bromide in the next step. So the same protein you cleave with cyanogen bromide and uh, we know that there are two methionine in the sequence so you'll get three peptides after treatment of CNBR. So these three peptides are again separated using chromatography and they are sequenced using Edmund degradation method. And you know that they are C1, C2, C3, they are three peptides. So now using the peptide coming from trypsin and CNBR treatment, you can uh, overlap them. And by overlapping, you can know the exact sequence of this protein. So for example, you just see E is the first amino acid. It means C1. C1, C1, this is the first peptide. So C1 is the first peptide from N terminal side. Now you need to see whether it will be C2 or C3 after this. You just compare this sequence of C1 with peptide which came from trypsin uh, hydrolysis. So for example, C1 is ending at uh, GASM. You see the sequence. So look for GSM sequence in trypsin product. So GSM is coming here at T1. You see here T1. It means C1 continues to T1. So after C1, 
it will be T1 here. This will be the second peptide. Now you look at T1 is ending at M-A-L-I-K. Look for M-A-L-I-K sequence in Cyanogen CNBR treatment peptides. So M-A-L-I-K is coming here at C3. It means after T1 it will be C3. So C3 will be after T1. No left with C2, so after this it will be C2. So that's how you can deduce by superimposing, by overlapping sequ peptide sequences from two different uh, treatments. You can overlap them and you can deduce complete sequence of the protein. So if you summarize all these steps of protein sequencing, you need to separate polypeptide. If there are more than one polypeptide in the protein, you need to separate them before going for admin degradation. You need to reduce disulfide bond. If disulfide bonds are there, you need to break them. Uh, and uh, you need to determine composition of the each chain like we have done by hydrolysis, acid hydrolysis method. You need to identify N-terminal or C-terminal amino and C-terminal amino acid. N-terminal you can use a Sanger's reagent. C-terminal can be identified using carboxypeptidases. Then uh, each uh, cleave each chain into a smaller fragment. You can use proteases like we have done earlier. You can use protease to uh, to hydrolyze uh, protein into small peptides. And those peptides can be separated using HPLC or some other chromatographic technique. And from there, uh, those can be sent for admin degradation sequencing. So all the peptides, purified peptide sequencing can be uh, achieved using same chemical method. Now, the same protein is treated with some other enzyme or some other reagent. Uh, those peptides produced from some another enzyme, those are also separated and they are sequenced. And then these sequences from two different enzyme treatment, they are overlapped in order to deduce complete sequence of the protein. Even if they are disulfide bonds, disulfide bonds also, they can be determined from the sequencing. Separation is very important because for example, if there are two chains, chain one and chain two, which are linked by disulfide bond. You need to separate them. Uh, why? Because two chain means they are two N terminal. So 2N terminal means in every cycle of admin degradation, you will get two peaks. So for example, in first cycle, you get one peak for uh, phenylalanine, another peak for glycine. So it means they are two, two terminal, two free terminal. One is starting with phenylalanine, other is starting with glycine. In second cycle, you will get two peak again. One is for isoleucine, another one will for valine. But you cannot, it's difficult for you to put them after phenylalanine will be isoleucine or valine or after glycine will be isoleucine or valine. So sequencing cannot be done if there are more than one polypeptide in the, in the reaction mixture. That's why you need to separate them. And if it's disulfide bone, you need to break disulfide bones as well.